All right, everybody. Vinny Fisher here back with another episode of Total CEO. I have a great guest today, but before I get to that, hey guys, I run a company like a lot of you do, fully accountable. That's my thing. I have this show because as a CEO, I'm always dealing with growth and scale in our business, how to pay attention to certain things, what's a distraction, what's not. Well, I'll tell you, as a trusted advisor, I get paid a lot of money to be, make strategic decisions for people. So do the people in our company, and we help people all the time. But I can tell you, you need to pay attention to this show because the gentleman I'm having on today, Chris Voss, game changer for you as a trusted advisor to the businesses you work with. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Hey, Chris, I know we're new friends and it's brand new. It started with me rifling through, and it probably looks backwards. I got to do something like this. A book, everybody, I want to stop right now before I let him tell a little story about himself. He wrote a book and he's done more than that. This book is chronicling his life as an FBI negotiator. And it's called Never Split the Difference. I'm going to proudly tell you that this is probably going to make my top five list of books. Now, Chris, I read 51 books last year, and I don't think I've had a year where I've read less than 40. And it's some I repeat read because I love them. This book will not get gifted as the actual copy because I wrote in it like crazy. Why don't we, before we get into that, can you just give a little brief commercial about you and who you are? Sound good, Chris? All right, well, I was the FBI's, I was the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. I took those ideas and started teaching them in business schools and the business people. And I uh, wrote the book, Never Split the Difference. Uh, now the CEO of the uh, Black Swan Group. And we coach people on how to use these sort of emotional intelligence tactics. Love it. For great business negotiations. Yeah, so I would tell you, we can find you in multiple places. They can go right to the blackswangroup.com and find everything about you guys as a company. Well, it's blackswanltd.com. Blackswanltd.com. Okay, great. So you guys call yourselves the Black Swan Group, but your actual URL is blackswanltd.com. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. All right, awesome. So Tribe, you can find him there. I would absolutely recommend you type that URL in and go find a way to absorb the information that Chris is out there talking about. Let me just, I got to ask so many questions today. We're going to head in like 18,000 directions because I've got someone on the line who I don't just met you and I extremely respect the things you've done, Chris. So I, I, uh, I might sound a little giddish and giddy is because I am. And so I got a bunch of questions for you. Um, so let me start with this. If they wanted to get the book, what's the best way someone gets their hands on the book? Well, Amazon, I mean, Amazon consistently has the best prices, you know, it's a great marketplace. When I buy them myself, I go and get I get them cheaper from Amazon than I can from my publisher. <laughs> uh, that's cool. So I uh, I uh, bought your book, and I just, I'm going to hang out with a friend, and I bought him a copy, and I was on a show today bragging about how awesome it is. And so I I don't hey, if you say you're not a reader, start questioning that decision. But if you are a reader and this isn't one you've read, read it. If it's one you've read, you missed the excitement that I'm sharing right now, then go find a way to reread it. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. What do you think when you look back, not just in like, we can get into so many romantic stories of all these heroic things you did at the FBI, which by the way are amazing, Chris, let me just say that. But, um, and I do want to make light of some of the tragedy. It really Thanks. is Thanks. amazing with the stuff you've done there. And, uh, and our government's better for that. And I really appreciate first and foremost, your dedication Thank you. It comes through loud and clear in this book. And so, uh, I, I know there's been very sleepless nights for you and your wife and your family over that kind of uh, burden in your life. And that's a blessing. And I really appreciate, I feel like I know why I feel safer and it's because of people like you. So thanks, Chris. I just want to stop and say that first. But That's very kind of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Now I want to ask you some good, fun questions. So right. when, you, when you deal with CEOs like in, and we're working on business deals, you talked about in the book, this idea that when we get to the end of the negotiation, we're tired and we start making concessions. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, decision fatigue. I mean, we put a lot of, a, a lot of effort in the process so far. We're scared we're going to lose that effort. I mean, uh, understanding how loss affects us 
is mm. what a hostage negotiator does. I mean, so we, as a hostage negotiator, I learned to look for the lost issues right up front. Mm. Um, and I found that that's actually the most compelling and powerful impact in business negotiations also, that people are worried about what the losses are. Yeah. So if you're doing it at the end, there's a right. The other thing too is if you're making concessions at the end, you probably viewed it, you know, as a boxing match and your trust levels are not high and you're afraid about implementation also, hmm. which has caused it to be a boxing match. So I love really, when you you're said, making, I love you. I'm going to cut you off a lot because I'm just an idiot. But so excellent. Really, no, good, man. And so I, I just like the popcorn style. It, you know, like one of the things that was an aha moment for me in your book was it's at, if you know there's a deadline, use it to your advantage. Don't be freaked out that you didn't get the deal done. I love how you said, wait a minute, why can't that be used as a power card? Why does it have to be used as a negative in your mind? And so that's like a shifter for me because I, I stopped and looked at my deals where I thought there was a deadline. And even when I'm a lawyer and I was negotiating for other people, like this arbitrary deadline caused you to negotiate it differently. And I love how you turned it on its head and say, why not use that to your advantage? Because they feel the same way as you do. And so that's a kind of a, a deal changer. You know, what's funny is I started thinking about how to have, so I think the premise that like speaks loud and clear is we don't ask good questions. Right. We don't extract it yeah. out of people. S smart know-it-alls like me want to just keep talking, 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 but we're not asking good questions. So my trust advisor practice exploded because I asked good questions. And so how do, let's, let's just kind of go into like clients you've worked with or students you have at your, uh, when you're teaching this. How do you help someone really ask better questions? Well, first of all, make them aware of their addiction. And everybody's got an addiction to yes. And your, good, your questions become good as soon as you stop. You get out of closed-ended questions where you're trying to simply confirm bits of information. You know, isn't it true? Do, do, would you like? Would this work for you? And all those questions which give you no real information. You know, it's always, it, the real answers are always yes and, or no and. And you need everything that comes after the and. Yeah. So you flip over to what and how's, and immediately you're starting to hit, now you're hitting gold mines of information. Well, I'll tell you, I've done this for the last few days, only asking what and how questions. And I, and I used to ask a lot of whys. And I felt like I was, a, I was trying to like, point out why someone didn't do something. And I love how you called me out in the book on that. And I've only been doing hows and whys. Like, and even my wife's like, hey, what's up? Why are you doing this? Like, she's even smelled it after 23 <laughs> years. But I'm learning so much more. Like, and I love, you do something that I am going to have to work really hard at. I, Tribe, have you noticed when I ask him a question, how he sits there for like three seconds and doesn't even want to respond until he's ready? That pregnant pause is huge, what? man. Huge. Yeah, and a lot of people are afraid of that silence. Uh, you know, uh, two out of three people don't like two out of three for different reasons. You know, uh, and there's a, there's a type out there that hates silence because they feel out of control. They feel disconnected. Mm. And there's another goes silent. They give people the silent treatment. And so their problem is they think that if they stop to listen, they're afraid the other side's going to think they're mad and they don't want that to happen. So, yeah, silence is a great tool if you can wrap your mind around it. Oh, well, you're doing it to me here and it's like Jedi Ninja. Like, why is he waiting so long to answer? And I already know he told me he's going to do that. And I, I'm like, I was raised in a way don't like, I'm, I, think, <laughs> I think I'm part accommodator and part agitator because I think I'm like a mix. I'm going to take that personality thing, you that resource you gave me. and. So I don't like silence. I have to live and learn to like a little more silence. And so appreciate you calling me out on that. And you wrote that specifically for me because in my arrogant self, everything's about me. But, you know, let me ask you a question. <laughs> let me ask you another question. What, what do you dare somebody to try first? Because like I love in your book how you say, oh my gosh, my student did this. And every story in there is a, one about someone who like actually implemented what I get extremely frustrated about as a trusted advisor is we give out this wisdom and people don't try it. So what do you dare someone to be the first thing they try in implementing your stuff? You know, uh, summarize what somebody else has said to you until they say that's right. 
Can we walk through that a little bit? Walk, walk me through that a little bit. Mess with me. Beat me up a little bit. Like, let's do that. Show me how that would work. Show our people how you, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, all right. So classic example, one of my favorites in the book, a woman who's pharmaceutical sales is trying to uh, get a, a doctor in a route to buy a drug. Oh, yeah. And, and, he, and he looks at her as a mercenary. You know, uh, traveling salesperson, you know, all, all the bad things that we see about, even though he knows her personally as a good person, yep. you know, it's hard to get away from the stigma of sales. And so he won't buy the drug because he thinks she's completely self-interested company. interested. So she goes out, sets an appointment with him one day to get a that's right. And this is what she says. Because you got to sound like you're talking the other side into their position. That's what scares people. <sighs> and she says, you know, you're not just going to buy any drug that some pharmaceutical sales rep is selling because it's their hottest drug and nobody else has cloned it yet and it's their highest profit center. She said, you're not going to do that. She said, you know, your, your patients are more than just patients. They're people to you. You feel responsible for their lives. And because you're responsible for their entire lives, you're just not going to take the hottest drug some pharmaceutical sales rep is selling. Hmm. And she said, he's, you know, and again, that sounds like he's, she's trying to talk herself out of the sale. But she said he turned and looked at her as if it was the first time he'd ever seen her. And he said, that's right. And she made the sale. And so I love that. And so practicing how and what's and asking good how and what's, we can default to the how and what's that you suggest in your book, but make it relational to them. But tell, connect with them. They're human. They're emotional. They're erratic, just like you and I, right? And so I love that point. What's a... Uh, What's one thing our community can do to help you like, and get this message out? Because, boy, people need to hear this, Chris. And so what can we do to support you in getting this message out? Because I think this is going to be already a game changer in how I deal with my children. It already is. I've been doing it for the last couple of days, and it's totally working. And my 16-year-old's like, like, I can already see it. And so thank you. So what can we do to help you get this message out? Well, the best way to make me and my company a steady resource for you and everybody you know is to get them is to su subscribe to the newsletter. We put it out once a week. It's called The Edge. Um, you know, short, digestible articles, because negotiation is also a perishable skill. So you got to do a little bit of maintenance. It's not as much work as it takes to get good, but it's like a car. You got to maintain it. You got to work and, the muscle, right? Yeah, you got to work the muscle. So, what'd you and, call uh, it? The so Edge? Yeah. Did you call it The Edge? And the name of it is The Edge. Yeah, The Edge. And then how does somebody go get on the newsletter? Well, if you, if you, you can text to sign up, you can send a text to the number 22828. That's 22828. 22828. 22828. And the magic words, of course, well, that's right. <laughs> I love the text it. With no spaces, no spaces and no punctuation. Leave so just the that's right. Out. It's one Don't word put a space in the middle. All right, that's exactly. right. Yeah, and Without you get an interaction. You, okay. That's right. <laughs> and then, that's right. And then what that does is that starts someone into a sequence? Yeah, you get, a, you get an email, uh, you get a text back that says, put your email address in that connects you to, to the gold mine, you know, the, the library. The, the, is, we've got free stuff. we get stuff that we ask you to pay for. Now, what's um, like, you'll always what get more of the... Chris, we have a lot of CEOs that watch our show. And so I'm sure we're going to get people to sign up for the edge. But like, what if someone like wants to skip right to the front of the line? Do, do you actually work with people from the Black Swan group, like with companies or with CEOs? And if so, how do you do that? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and the, the edge is the avenue because it connects us to you. We work with individuals, we work with companies, we work with conferences. You know, we work with, you know, we got some basic uh, stuff to start out with if you're still building your assets and you know, we've got more complicated stuff we'll come out to your company we'll, we'll tailor something for you and your business you know we'll find a way to help you get better you know chris i'm looking forward to this because you know we built a trusted advisor platform because we at fully accountable you know we learned that the best thing we can do is help the accounting professional understand the real value they bring to a business and help them realize they actually already are the trusted advisor and they devalue some of themselves. They actually relegate themselves to a bean counter. And I think if they actually 
implemented a bunch of the stuff you talk about, they would embrace much faster, uh, maybe not faster, maybe for a long-term effect, this idea that they already are a trusted advisor to a business. And so I suspect Fully Accountable is going to be all over you guys and finding ways for you to come out to our events and to be with our people. And so I'm personally looking forward to that. And for you trusted advisors listening, I'm like, they're probably like, Vinny, make that happen. But so that's cool. So when we're on the edge, we'll get a newsletter. Let me ask you a question. You talked about this idea of fear. Like today I was on the phone with a friend of mine and he was in his own head about a client wants to fly him out to move to another part of the country and the client agreed to pay for it. And he says to me, you know, I'm not sure I want to take him up on that because I'm going to feel like I owe him something. And Chris got in my head, Mr. You. And I said, wait a minute. Why, why do you feel like you, you automatically need to owe him something in return? How about the fact that there, his business is going to benefit from your proximity of being there? And so then he started wanting to negotiate other deals. He goes, that's right. Like what? He started changing his mind. I go, and so I want to talk about this idea of obligation in our negotiations. So could you talk a little bit about why the heck we feel like we owe something in return because somebody gives us something. Well, and, and then see, there's a secondary issue there because if you feel that what you're playing out is you, in your head is you don't know how to say no. Mm. You feel like that, you know, we only, we see no when we think of it is us going, no! And no is this really horrible thing. When, if you feel you're over, over obligated, you want them to see what you're dealing with. You, the best way to say no is look at them and say, how am I supposed to do that? Yeah. Now that, and people are, don't understand how powerful that phrase is, but if someone is trying to get you to do something that you don't feel is fair, the very first thing to say to them is, you know, how am I supposed to do that? And that begins to change everything about the, the dynamic. So you recommend that any sensitive type negotiation, we do our best to try to have that where we're with each other. Whether that looks like something like this where we're looking at each other in a video setting, but in the ideal situation, you wanna be in the room with somebody. That's your general recommendation. So how do you overcome a space where we just do business, like even our company, we do business all over the place. Like, so how do you help marry those two concepts? Well, begin to understand uh, that you can communicate via email and text, but it's got to be in bite sizes. Okay. Like the big the big problem people do with emails is it's like playing chess via email. Are you going to the other side your next seven moves if you're playing chess on email? Mm. No, you're not going to do that because they get a chance to look over the whole thing and they say, I don't like where this ends up. And so if you look at it in small bites, then if you try to communicate in an email a little at a time, you find that those types of communications um, are much better. And I was coaching a client just the other day who'd had a very bad in-person. And I said, all right, we're moving this to email because we got to slow this down and we got to chop this up a little bit into little pieces and we'll be able to do that via email. So if you understand how to use the tool, it's like a golf club. It's just the right tool for the right time. Well, I love that. That is really, sorry about that noise. It looks like I'm, everything is happening to take one of my favorite interviews and mess with it today. So sorry about that. I usually don't hear it in this room, but something's going on here today. So I apologize to everybody listening and to mostly to you, Chris. Sorry about that. Um, so it's, talk to me you know, about- It's the Russians. It's the Russians. See, they want in on this. They, they do. Yeah, I love how your book plugs Trump. <laughs> But this book is much older than that. So like you look at the book now, you're like, oh, Chris is a genius for plugging Trump. You know, what made you pick an influential business leader like that? And you wrote this book a while ago. Well, he, you know, he's an example of um, one type and the best of his class, if you will. He's an assertive negotiator and, and it's great to study someone that is that effective at that and decide what about that you like, what, what you don't like, quite frankly, or what you want to improve on. Like, I'm a natural born assertive. So I was born Donald Trump type. And I've come to learn what those shortcomings are and how to try to get out of them so I can raise the level of my game. Gotcha. Love it. So 
what are you do what are you doing what what are you seeing right now and ask a chris question what are you finding to be the most uh, the biggest challenge for you guys at black swan right now you know uh, visibility um having enough people uh, find out about the book you know my my director of operations happens to be my son you know it's 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 visibility like uh, because Anybody that sees the book, I mean, it's a well-written book. I, I, I get Tal Ross co-wrote it with us to structure the book so that it was fun to read. It's, it makes sense and it's digestible. And we're not getting any negative reviews on it. You look at the animals on it. I don't even know how that's possible. Yeah, not only do you tell great stories, but you, at the end of each, and there's some new concepts there, but at the end of each chapter, you, you break it down in bite-sized bullets to give me like action steps. Like, Chris, I, you know, if this is your first books out of the box, then, uh, then Mr. Roz, whatever you say his name, put you in uh, your team in a wonderful position. So anybody who's hating on this book, you know, I've come to learn there are certain haters you just ignore. And so that would be one of them. And I, I have absolutely nothing to complain about this book other than I didn't read it soon enough. And that would be the only complaint I would bring to the table. <laughs> okay. Thank you well, very much. Let me ask you, you this. Let's talk about the uh, dynamic of your son working with you. How how can, how do you guys, how did you guys figure out or do you continue to figure out uh, you know that whole situation? Because you know I, in my old life as a as a trust and corporate lawyer, I always worked with family succession. Dad and son seem to be my client of choice. So talk to me about some of those dynamics. Like, what's the hardest part of of navigating? Does does what's your son's name? Brandon. His name Brandon. is Brandon. So what's Brandon's role at the company? Uh, you know, he, he, he is a director of operations. He's also phenomenally involved in, in all the training and the teaching. Cool. He's my, my, he's my most trusted guy. I mean, he's got the keys to the king. So he is he's your bank most accounts. trusted advisor. He knows everything. That's awesome. Yeah. And so yeah. he's the operations officer. He runs the show. Yeah, he really does. Yeah. That's awesome. So how do you deal with, you know, I always, you know, one of the things I'm always talking to CEOs about is this dynamic between a great business and a guru. Like where, how do you navigate the two of those? Have you thought about that this is built so much on your celebrity? Cause you, you have an amazing story. How do you, as you think about the growth of the business, what parts of that burden you and you think about growing this beyond and something that looks like legacy? Yeah, well, we're trying to build it out. I mean, that's why the company is the Black Swan Group. It's not uh, Chris Voss Incorporated. It's not right. the Chris Voss Show. You know, so we've, and the idea is that we develop people and, um, you know, it just ha doesn't have to be Chris Voss. It's a method that we've, we've all brought together. And so as you're growing, how many people, how do you fight? Because this is a great question. I think it sounds very arrogant. But I want to help. How do we... Because this happens in our business, so I know what happens in a lot of them. How do, how do you deal with people who want to come engage the company, but they want a chunk of Chris, but it's really, it needs to be bigger than that. And you can't give a chunk of you to everybody. So how do you guys deal with that? Well, sometimes we just don't do it. Okay. Um, you know, I, and, and it's how to effectively say no, how to make a decision. Um, and I'll say, look, you know, I would love to be able to help you out. We've got all these, you know, my son, Brandon, writes articles for the newsletter, The Edge. Yep. So I'm like, and we've had people actually call up and say, like, we don't want you. We want him because he wrote this article. Nice. So it's, it's constantly bringing out all, emphasizing all of the faces of the company to other people. It's a team game. I mean, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go as a team. Oh, man. Want, amen. Amen there, Chris. Can you say that again just so everybody hears that? If you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go as a team wow man if you all of you listening and watching hear nothing else if you want to go fast then just be a solopreneur shoot your way go go guru style put cash in your pocket if you want this thing to be around and go far you need team you need depth you need something that's bigger than you Chris, I've been preaching this from the rooftops. I've written multiple books. It's like my number one thing. Without a team, you are literally playing a solo sport. And, you, you know, you can only, your career ends, it's done. And so I, I love that. I, I can tell by the way you write this book and who you are, you and I would be like buds hanging out. And so 
Uh, that's the second plug where I'm telling you, you should be my friend. But so uh, that's awesome. So uh, personal yeah. life. And you know, I, 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 I just want to throw, throw one more thing on, on that idea. Like even if you're determined to go it alone, you're going up against teams. Mm. So you're going to lose anyway in the long run because the teams are going to beat you. Your opposition are going to be in teams. And I know what I like you say about that. In your book, you talk about when you're the lead negotiator, you've got four or five people or whatever the number is behind you listening to different parts of it because they're going to hear things that you didn't hear. So that's this whole idea of a team, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and like I'll never negotiate alone. I'll always have another one of my colleagues on the phone with me because they're going to hear stuff I don't hear. That's amazing. Get, so we just – I won't negotiate alone. Nothing important. Period. So if, we, if, if you, we're a decent sized organization. So you would tell me today, Vinny, do not negotiate again alone. Have one of your executive team members with you on, on all of the negotiations that you know, require you to, to be on your best game. I mean, they're not going to be in my wife's discussions, but what you're saying is I should have my executives involved in my negotiations. Yeah, another pair of ears. And, and their job is just clarification. Every now and then they throw some clarification in there. And you'll be stunned at what a difference it makes. Oh, man, Rachel, our COO is going to love to hear that. Because we actually, when we do it right, and, you know, we're probably wrong more than we're right, or hopefully we're right more than we're wrong because we're growing. But let's, that could be because in spite of ourselves. But when we do that, uh, I find us um, actually making better, effective decisions, both for our prospect slash future client as well as for us so great advice if you didn't catch that don't go at it alone when you're negotiating get a second set of ears you don't need a second set of lips someone talking too much is too much right but you need a second set of ears right exactly right the job is to pick up the stuff that you're missing i love it i love it what would be the one thing you would tell somebody if this is relatively new to them, because you know, when I, why, let me frame that question a little bit better. So I hear people say things all the time, like they don't want a big team. And it's their way of like feeling bad about, they had a couple crappy hires and they like, they put this anchoring in their head. What would be some advice you'd give somebody who's like, I just am not a good negotiator. Like they're just talking themselves out of the ability to negotiate. What advice would you give that person? Um, you know, don't take yourself hostage by beating yourself before you get to the table. Mm. You know, you'll say, ah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring this up. They'll react negatively, or this is a non-starter. Um, no matter what percentage of the time you write about non-starters, you're not percent a thousand percent of the time, which means you're walking away from value. Uh, if you, if you're respectful, uh, even deferential in the negotiation, you can ask for anything. There aren't any non-starters. Be nice about it. So be nice and be aggressive at the same time, but be nice. I got it. Well, you know, I like how you say, be who you are. If you're built a certain way and you try to act like somebody else, it's just not going to be authentic. So, you know, some people are going to have to probably seek more gratitude because they're generally nice, right? But for people who are, don't try to be a hardball who doesn't do it in a nice way because it's just not going to work, right? Well, it, be who you are, but understand what, what supplemental skills compliment who you are okay cool i like that you know, that's a better adding complimentary skills is, is not betraying who you are and and you know just add good complimentary skills to your core well my Stuff. wife would say i need a lot more complimentary skills so this is good this is uh <laughs> this is good hey you know we're we're kind of running out there's one thing in your book that i i want to i want to poke in a little since i got you here and it's all about me can you talk about that 738 55 a little bit. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, you know, uh, it's how much we pick up of meaning from words versus how things are said. You know, more is it what's more important, what you say, how you say it. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate as to which is more important, but what really matters is when they don't line up. You mm. know, and, and, and so I, I believe that the, the most important thing is the way you say it. But you may say, well, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing are my words. Either way, if what I said and how I've said it doesn't line up, there's a problem and you got to fix it. And you got you to gotta hear that. And then gently, work, you know, somebody could say to you, 
yes. And I might say, eh, it seemed like there's a little bit of hesitation in that yes. I just did that to our Atlanta director of marketing company. yesterday, Chris. I asked her about something and she, I'm like, so is that ready to go? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, are you sure? Like you paused. And she's like, what are you talking about? I go, well, Chris said, you know, when you answer one way and you pause, I'm not convinced that's your answer. She's like, well, you know, it's funny you say that. I wasn't sure I liked the page as much. It's ready, but I was hoping to do something else with it. And it's hilarious. Had I not paid attention to that nonverbal cue, we wouldn't have had that discussion. It's hilarious how, how arrogant I am to skip past some of those obvious things because I'm so full of wanting to talk that I'm actually got to use these things a little bit more. So great advice on that. Hey, Chris, we're running out of time. What would be one little nugget you want to leave everybody with before we say goodbye? Learn how to express no gently. Hmm. You, you won't take yourself hostage you'll find better deals. So what is one way that, or like one little way you can help somebody? Cause you know, it's funny, I'm convinced, just like you said in your book, the vast majority of people have convinced themselves that they're afraid of conflict. And so no sounds like conflict. So what is learning how to say no without actually using those words? What's a good little nugget tip of like, here, go do this and then come back to me. Like, what's the first Jedi thing you would tell me to do? Um, there's a technique called mirroring, which is just repeating the last three words of what somebody just said. You know, spend, spend a day, uh, maybe Saturday, because it's a less important day. Whatever day it is, make that mirror day and do that in all your conversations just to see what happens. Yeah, so it's funny you say that. So I've been trying that. And if I, and then I all of a sudden I start paying, I'm listening more. Thank you. My wife really appreciates you for that. But I, <laughs> I, I, I noticed people end their sentences with some prepositions. So what I need to do is go back a few words and go to the core words. That's what you're talking about, right? Because everyone ends with like four, with this, uh, like all these words that don't mean anything, but there's a few words in there that you're talking about mirror those words, right? Well, see, now, that, now that's an advanced ability, and I'm impressed that you're do, doing that. You could do it either way. When you're really good, you go back and pick out those core words. So I noticed, like, who cares if I'm saying for, with, but? Like, it's all these messy words. That, can I learn that probably as a writer and maybe as a lawyer? But So that, that point is there is go pick out the significant words they ended with and mirror that, right? Is that what you would recommend? Yeah, just, just word for word, about three words. Cool. Don't paraphrase. Don't make it more than three. Just three words, word for word. I love it. That's actually probably one of my favorite tips is mirroring. And I've been doing it like crazy. And I, it totally works. So thank you for that, Chris. Hey, we're out of time. I want to thank Chris Voss for being our guest. Hey, listen, Tribe, this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have him back if he wants to be back. I'd Go love to. get the book. This never split the difference. It looks like this. I bought it on Amazon. I also recommend, I'm going to sign up for your newsletter on my fancy phone as soon as we hang up, 22828 to get on the newsletter. Everybody have a great day. Chris, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Vinny. My pleasure.